Welcome to TMZ Live. Harvey Levin here. Charles here. This is really interesting. Jesse Smollett <laughs> has He's back. filed an appeal with the Illinois Supreme Court. And I know a lot of you are saying, oh, come on, this is ridiculous. He should just serve his time. I get it. But this is a really interesting argument that Jesse is saying he made a deal with the prosecutor when he was first indicted on 16 counts of faking this alleged attack. And the deal was if he performed community service and forfeited his bail to Cook County for all of the overtime the officers um, incurred for investigating this, they would drop the case, which they did. And then they bring a special that, prosecutor in, right. and they prosecute him after that happens. He's saying, deal's a that deal. second prosecution should never have happened because we had a deal on the first one. And I met and the deal. And, and he, that he did, he held up his end of the bargain. It is amazing to think that we are still talking about this case. It is now but we're talking five about years. It but we're talking about no, it differently now. I, no, my point is, this happened five years ago. Right. His, his first um, indictment happened uh, four years ago. Right. And then he gets let off. And then he gets convicted the second time. And he serves, and he's been a, and and he served six, six days. days right. And now there's 144 days left. And he's been appealing. And he's fighting it and fighting it. And this he may an, have an argument now. This is an interest. Now, he's tried the argument at the trial level and he lost. He tried the argument at the appellate court and he lost. So now he's at the Supreme Court. I would raise with you I know the Bill Cosby case. I knew you were going to say. Well, because, because it is very similar. Very similar. The cases are very different. Right, but right. Legally, what they're both putting in front of the judge. A deal's a deal. Look, look, there are some similarities. Remember in the Bill Cosby case, he was convinced to testify and did so after being promised that he wouldn't be prosecuted for this. And then he was prosecuted. And that well, was, he, it was a deal. He was to sit for a deposition. Right. He, was, he right, sat for a deposition, his... which then was used in the trial uh, to convict him. Uh, and the uh, Pennsylvania Supreme Court said, uh-uh. There was a, you made a deal that none of that would be used in a trial, and you can't do it. So they, re, they threw the conviction out. And it's he got out same, of prison. It is the same principle here yeah. with a different court, an Illinois court, but still, it's a very interesting argument. It's a fascinating argument. I mean, from Jussie's perspective, he's saying, even if you don't like the deal that you struck, you have to live by it because I serve the community service and I forfeited the bond. So I've lived up to my bargain. Even if the special prosecutor comes in and says, hey, that was a bad deal we struck. I'm not going to honor it to Jussie, who has already relied upon it. It should probably stick. And that's the argument he wants to make to the Supreme Court to finally win on this idea. And I don't even think it's a reliance issue. I think it's simply an issue that the prosecutor said, you do X and Y and we'll dismiss the case. And that'll be it. And he did it. I, I, so this is basically going, it's, it's, it's going back on the deal you made. Going back on the deal. And he says that what he writes in, this, uh, in his documents that, that he's presented now to the Illinois Supreme Court, that the special prosecutor was only brought in to prosecute him because of the public outrage. And right. the public was outraged. The Chicago Police Department was outraged. Right. Absolutely outraged. Sense. Uh, over the fact that he was let off the hook. Well, they were pissed eyes. off at Kim Fox, who yes. was the prosecutor. Right. Um, so, I mean, all those things are true. You can't argue that there was public I, outrage. I got to say, I would not be shocked if they throw this conviction out. It's a, it's, it's his best argument because he look. I mean, let's get real for a second. <laughs> You can't argue he didn't do it. Right. You can't argue Even about faking it. Even though he's still insisting. He... I know he's yeah. insisting it, but right. everybody knows what happened here. But this is a really solid argument, and we'll see what the court does. But I guess the question is, if they, if they throw the conviction out, mm -hmm. does it reset Jesse's career? Jesse's career. Hi, my name is Kyla, and I'm in Atlanta. So the lawyer in me really thinks that this is an interesting case. To answer your question, I don't think that it'll reset anything about his career, but I do think that it'll set case law about how prosecutors are now to go about setting agreements. <clears throat> what would be interesting to me to see is what is actually said in the language of that prosecutorial contract. Did it say we're just going to drop this case, or did it say we're going to drop this case and any incidences stemming from that night or that 
that day when it happened. Because if it was something stemming from that incident in totality, then yeah, the case should be dismissed and, and dropped and he should not be prosecuted. But if they specifically only mentioned this one disorderly mm. conduct charge that they were not going to go after, then hey, just well, it was 16. Stick. It was 16 disorderly. 16, 16 charges. Yeah. Uh, okay. There was a monumental yeah. verdict is... today that is going to affect, I think, it has to affect every parent in the United States. Absolutely. It has to. Uh, and especially as it deals with uh, violence in schools and what parents, uh, what responsibility parents bear. Uh, Jennifer Crumley, she is the mother of Ethan Crumley, the uh, shooter at Oxford High School in Michigan. Uh, that was the school shooting that happened back in November of 2021. Four students shot and killed. Right. Uh, and Ethan was convicted and uh, sentenced to life in prison back in December. His mother, Jennifer, was on trial, uh, just started last week. The trial um, ended and they came back with a verdict this morning, guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Four charges, guilty. She faces 15 for each. years in prison for- For each uh, count, by the way. For, for well, I think, I think it's cumulative. Well, I'm, I'm not, I think this might be cumulative. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. but I, I don't think it's 60 or years. concurrent. That yeah, that's concurrent. Right. But, um, Look, here, here's the thing. Um, the jury believes she was grossly negligent in not, in not taking steps to prevent Ethan from going to that school and basically shooting it up. Now, the interesting part of this is she testified, number one, that the school itself had told her, stay, you know, make sure that Ethan is around kids. It's going to help him. She said, look, I knew he had trouble. I had no idea he was capable of anything like this. And as for the gun, she testified, that that was yeah, the husband. gun was out, but my husband was the one in charge of keeping it safe. Yet she was still found guilty. That's got to, and I mean, it, it seems like the, the, like the jury is saying that parents, this is on you. And you've got to have a better, keep a closer watch on your kids and be more aware of what um, what they're going through, and, and, and by the way, so so it's the first time that a parent has ever been charged and convicted in one of these school shootings. We see them obviously, unfortunately, quite a bit. First time they've been uh, convicted. Secondly, it doesn't just the, the the reasoning of this liability doesn't just stop with the parents, right? Anytime they're saying that anytime somebody has a reason to suspect that. Somebody they know is potentially mm -hmm. a threat to the life of a third person. You now have an obligation to step in and prevent it. It's a I, huge I, I thing. I don't know that, Jason, because I think it requires having a duty to supervise. And if you have a duty to supervise and you're grossly negligent, but I think if it's a stranger who happens to hear but it also, that a kid might be doing something, but it I don't be know an educator, it, though. It could be an educator. It, it, it could, be, it could an be an educator. Right? It, it could, could be an educator. It could certainly be a husband and wife. It could be any sort of an adult authority in the it, near a child. They are always have a duty to protect that child. So and here's here's the question. And and look, I don't know the answer to this, but I think it's a valid question. If you think your kid is having trouble, if your kid is having mental you know mental challenges, and you know the kid is even acting up and maybe even even violent. Mm -hmm. It is a big step to say he is going to go to a school and start right. shooting people. So exactly what is a parent supposed to do when they sense their kid is struggling? Who do you go to and what is it you what say do you do? He, he or she is capable of? I, one, one thing you could say is keep the guns away from him, right? That, that's, that's true. That's, that's a pretty this, good the first, first step. One. But right. she yeah. didn't, but, but she was never, I, that, 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 the should, prosecution never said she's the one that kept that gun out so that he could get it. I mean, and she testified it was the father. We should say, by the way, the father, James. He's Crumley, going on trial, going next, on trial month. next month, so. But what does a parent do? Yeah. I, I, you know, what does a parent do when they sense that? Do they try to get a conservatorship? Do they take the kid to a psychiatrist? Um, is there a duty to do that? Do they even try and it, get an involuntary commitment? Of does it now 50? fall on the schools to have this conversation with parents like at the start of the year? But what do they do? I, I know, but I, that's what I'm saying. Do, should the schools be the ones who have to say to the parents, 
This is this is what you do. If you think, but what is that thing that you do? They gotta figure that out. Uh, well, I mean, but what? Who do you report it to? It's and like, what is it you're reporting? Jason, you're a parent. I mean, if your kid is having trouble, do you now project? the worst possible scenario, and you have a duty to do that. It's, it's impossible to put myself in that position. You're right, Harvey. I mean, when do you, nobody ever thinks that their kid, and she, there's no evidence that she thought her kid was capable of this type of action. So you're putting a huge burden on, and, and maybe it's okay, maybe we need to do the, put, apply this burden, but you're putting a huge onus on parents to step in just based on a suspicion. Ricky Wax here from Dallas, Texas, and I think this court ruling just opens up a bigger discussion that this, com this country is still at odds with, and that's with mental health and gun control. I think by having this verdict that it does, you know, deepen the conversation that parents need to have with their children when it comes to gun control and when it comes to mental health. And I think this is just to set an example that now the courts do mean business. There was a case where a mother had to turn her own son in because she saw a tablet of names he wrote down in a book, reported it to authorities, but it prevented possibly a mass shooting. So parents have to start taking this more you know, serious and consulting mental health people that can actually help their children. Yeah, wow, at the very least. Uh, okay, we are going to take a break. All right, so when we come back, uh, the NFL players and the commissioner arrive in Las Vegas and are immediately barraged with Taylor Swift. Uh, of course. Lots of Taylor Swift questions. You're going to see how Travis Kelsey handled them and also the commissioner. Uh, Travis Kelsey, for his part, he gave up uh, some tea on Taylor and her new album. Super Bowl has got to feel different this year for Travis Kelsey and probably all of the Chiefs uh, because when they arrived yesterday and they had their media day, almost all the questions were about Taylor Swift, <laughs> or at least to open up. Um, look, the, the media there knows what the people want to hear about, and Travis uh, had to be expecting that's this, almost, right? That's almost blasphemy to it, say that. It, it is, <laughs> but I, and believe me, I feel like it is and that these guys have worked really hard all year to get to this point. And there are millions and millions and millions of diehard football fans who can't wait for this game, but, but, but. before we get to the game, <laughs> uh, Travis did um, answer some of the questions about, look, he was good natured about it. It wasn't like he was ticked off that they, I think he well, of expected he this. Of course. Um, and in fact, he was willing to uh, give up some information about her upcoming album. She's unbelievable. She's, uh, she's rewriting the history books herself. Uh, I told her I'll have to hold up my end of the bargain and come home with some hardware, too. Um, I have heard some of it, yes, and it is unbelievable. I can't wait for uh, her to shake up the world when it finally drops. Oh, I can't give you anything. My, I, leave, I, leave, I leave that up to her. He said it's unbelievable. It's going to shake up the world. I mean... <laughs> I mean, I, I just... I mean, what else is he supposed to say? This, yeah, of this course. so you know I mean? extraordinary. But you know what? I, I, I was thinking that, too. I'm like, what is he going to say? He's not going to, oh, my girlfriend's album sucks. He's not going right. to say that. But remember, the reason that they initially even met is because Travis was a big Taylor Swift fan. So I actually take him at his word here. I, I think he's being genuine when he says that he actually enjoyed the album. I believe he enjoyed the album. Um, I just think... Can, can I just ask... What do the other teammates think? Because, yes, I, I get it, and From they all know they're all on board. Harvey, I talked to a guy a couple days ago, Justin Reed. He's one of the stars on the Chiefs' defense. He said that she is so nice and that she literally went around to each teammate and made a point to compliment them on something. So she seems like, or it seems like she's really ingratiating herself with his teammates. You might think they'd be upset with him because of all the attention and they're answering Taylor Swift questions, but it doesn't sound like that from the way the teammates are talking. That's really interesting. Like if Celine Dion were on the Chiefs, maybe <laughs> this would have gotten different. Well, then, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. That's, that's, a, um, good, that's listen, a good one. I, do, I mean, I do think these guys, uh, this is the pinnacle of their career. That's why I'm asking. And, it, but you know what? Maybe they get it out of the way and they just felt like, all right, media day, we sit down, we'll talk about they it. They are not getting it out of the way. This is going to go on all through the But game. I don't think it will bother them anymore for the rest of the week. And even Commissioner Goodell was at media day, of course, and he got all the questions about Taylor Swift. He very gracious, I don't know how we could do otherwise, graciously acknowledge the Taylor Swift factor in this season and the interest in particular, not only in the whole season, but in this game coming up on Sunday. So, you know the difference? 
They're, they're going to change the award at the end. It's going to no, be – Stop it. Stop. Most, no, this most, is blasphemy. Most blasphemy. Valuable Don't do this to Vince Lombardi. Player. Don't do it. Most valuable player, Taylor Swift. Vince Lombardi <laughs> is rolling around in his grave right now. <laughs> I, I, I. Unbelievable. And, oh. and, and you know, and the, uh, Taylor and Travis are going to be staying in a house right by the hotel where the rest of the team is. The interesting thing will be what happens after the game if the Chiefs win, though I think the Niners are going to win, but if the Chiefs win, what does she do as far as because they go normally out. she's got us. No, they're she, in Vegas. Charles, she's got to. She has to perform at the after party. No, stop it. She's no, not going to perform at the after party. No, she's not, she she not going to perform. But she no, she she's going to go for sure. Will, well, that's you, the question. Will they go out on the strip? They will absolutely perform. go out. They'll go to a club on the strip. We, we're doing a documentary on all of this because everybody else is talking sure. about it, right? And one of the things Taylor has said is she does not want anybody who is obsessed with privacy, which is really interesting. And w some of her prior boyfriends... That seems like who, a shot at it one is. of her prior boyfriends it is. in particular. Well, it is. <laughs> but she makes a real point of saying that. And Travis loves being out, loves this attention, sure. and she loves it too. So they will absolutely go out after this game. I have no doubt about it. Hi, this is April Showers, the Falcons fan of the year. So I will be in the Super Bowl. I won tickets to the Super Bowl. And of course, I'm from Atlanta. So this Taylor Swift thing is like out of control. But the people that's really like me, that's from Atlanta, we are more interested in, like, Usher. I love Taylor, mm -hmm. but I just don't want Taylor to overshine Usher because it's a piece of A-Town Down. <laughs> yeah, Usher is going to get plenty of shine on the day of the Super Bowl. Uh, Usher will get plenty of shine, but warning, she has overshadowed the NFL, so beware, Usher. Yeah, I, <laughs> I'm sure he's, he's, he's heard all of it. He's aware. Okay, we're going to move on. Yes, to uh, something really... Uh, I find it alarming, but, um, you know, when King Charles, when the palace announced that King Charles uh, was diagnosed with cancer, a, a form of cancer, which they're not saying what kind, um, but they said that he had informed Prince Harry as well as Prince William uh, and that they were both going to make efforts to see him. Obviously, it's easier for William. Right. Harry got on a plane on Monday evening uh, in L.A. and jetted back to London, landed there Tuesday morning and immediately uh, was driven to Clarence House where King Charles is. I just think the speed with which he made sure to get there. It does feel a little bit it alarming. It feels a little alarming. This has made a lot of people really uneasy because there was a lot of vagueness to the original Buckingham Palace announcement where they didn't say exactly what kind of cancer that Charles had and what stage it was at. But like you guys said, shortly after, I mean, just the fact that Prince Harry got on a plane so fast to go see his father, who, remember, he does not get along with, kind of shows you that maybe this is a rushed scenario. However, in the original statement, they did say at the very end that King Charles is looking forward to returning to public duty in the future, which made you think that's, like that's maybe uplifting. that's possible, you know, uh, uplifting without a doubt. But still, there's a lot we don't know. You yeah. say nothing if you're worried. But the fact that they said that, maybe that means... It's hard to... Whatever it is, it's going to be hard treatable. It's hard to decode that. It is hard to decode that. Right. And but, by the way, we should say that video we showed of, of King Charles and Camilla walking out, that they were leaving Clarence's house. So he's not, you know, he's not... He's not bedridden. He's not bedridden. He's up and he, moving he's around. He's apparently getting treatment. I think the interesting thing with Harry... Look, I saw some stories out that Harry is, has no plans uh, to see William. That's ridiculous. Of course they're going to see each other. I mean, they're both going to be both, with, with right. their dad at the same times time. that they can go see yeah, the king. They're going to run into each other. And, you know, they don't get along for sure. Um, and that doesn't mean they're going to repair the relationship. But I will say that this is a situation where, you know, they are facing the prospect that eventually it happens to everybody right. where both parents are gone. And when one parent is gone, especially in those circumstances, it's a terrible tragedy. But there's something else that when happens to human goes. beings when the second parent is struggling. And that may change the dynamic a little bit. We will see. We will see. Uh, eventually, we'll see that. Hopefully, King Charles is fine, and that's not the scenario they're dealing with. Right.
All right, we are going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to Vegas. Yes. But this time, we're going with a Vegas insider. Dana Rosselli is going to join us to tell you uh, all the inside info on the parties, the food, and where, yes, where Taylor and Travis might end up on Super Bowl night. Well, everyone is uh, flocking to Vegas slowly throughout the week because, of course, the Super Bowl going down on Sunday. Since it's raining so hard, they're sloshing to Vegas. <laughs> From L.A., they will definitely be sloshing. Yes. That's the truth. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Vegas is, on a regular weekend, Vegas is a lot of fun. I am a big advocate of Las Vegas. <laughs> um, <laughs> I also fund a lot of Las Vegas. But, <laughs> but, he does. Uh, I've actually been there with him once. That's true. This, but this weekend is going to be just ridiculous. And the amount of entertainment that Las Vegas has to offer, like I say, on a regular weekend is something, but they are stepping it up in a lot of different ways for the Super Bowl. So joining us right now to get the, the scoop on all the other things outside of the game going on in Vegas. Uh, Dana Rosselli is uh, a Vegas insider and host of Vegas Revealed podcast. And she is joining us right now from hey. somewhere. What, are, are you at the stadium right now, Dana? No, we're actually at the Westin Las Vegas. This is in an area called Lake Las Vegas. It's about, I'd say, 25 to 30 minutes from the Strip. This, this is where the teams are staying. Okay, so... Um, Vegas, like Charles said, is lit on any given weekend. <laughs> What's different about this coming weekend? What's going to happen? Well, I think that, you know, we're used to having people coming and going. And, yeah, it, it, we always have, you know, celebrities in town. But, I mean, I feel like this is going to be a huge mash of, of A-listers all, you know, combined into a few days. And I feel like that's a big deal. Um, it, you know, we've never thrown a Super Bowl before. I mean, we're used to, you know, having parties and having celebrities and having incredible DJs and performers all the time. But, it, but it's just going to be, you know, all at once. And I, I think it's going to be pretty incredible. And things are going to be, you know, like times 10. So um, give us something specific, something special that they're doing. Is there like they're a Taylor Swift yeah. thing that's going on where, you know, I don't know, Taylor Swift impersonators. <laughs> I mean, everybody's interested, obviously, in Taylor and Travis. So is yeah. there anything like special, special going on there for, for the weekend? Well, I can tell you that I actually have seen a Taylor Swift impersonator in a show <laughs> called Divas, and, and, and she, he was amazing. Ah, <laughs> Incredible. I Literally got it. looked just like Taylor. So I have a feeling that uh, he'll be out and about on the strip this weekend. But um, listen, you know, across from the wind, there's this lot, and they're doing this huge party. You probably know the H. Wood group doing a yep. huge party there. Um, they're going to have the future, uh, David Guetta. I'm hearing that stage tables, I just took some notes. Or actually going from about 45,000 to 100,000 oh to be my close to the God. stage. Did you yeah. just say this party cuz yeah. goes up to 100,000 a pop? They just found a huge open lot yeah. and said what can we do here? Let's oh, my yeah. God. Yeah, that's Vegas for you, right? And it's two nights. The next night's Jack Harlow. So, I mean, yeah, that's stage tables, like right next to the stage. That's the cost. Yeah, they're just doing this huge build-out. We've been watching them construct it. And, and you know, it's going to be two nights of parties. You know, they need this space. And then, of course, there'll be stuff going on in Excess Nightclub, you know, with Shaq's Funhouse and all that. All right. One cool thing that I, I know you always have the lowdown on, low on, and, in fact, when I go to Vegas, I always look at where Dana's gone to eat, and I know that's where I want to go eat. What, what, do, you, what do you have on, on the uh, culinary front for us uh, leading up to the Super Bowl? Well, you know where I've gone twice is Komodo, which is in the Fountain Blue that just opened, and I loved it. Oh, wait a minute. Komodo is from Miami, right? Yep. I've it, been yes. there. It, uh, that is a fabulous restaurant. <laughs> it, it really is. Obviously, we have, you know, Guy Fieri's throwing a lot of tailgate-type, you know, uh, parties. One on the patio. He's doing a huge tailgate for, like, 10,000 people Shh. right outside. The Link High Roller, Diplo's going to perform, uh, Dustin Lynch. Um, that's actually free to just register and go, but, you know, Know, there's like twenty dollar tickets you can get to make sure that you get in and, and get a spot. Wow, that's a great deal. Yeah, uh, yeah. just for twenty bucks. It is. Uh, well, <laughs> this was great. I was well, wondering if you'd make me feel left out, and you did. Well, here's how you can, <laughs> you can definitely feel left out. What about at the stadium? Because I know I haven't been to Allegiant Stadium, but I've heard that they have really good food. Are they doing anything different for the Super Bowl or? Yeah, you know, they're stepping up the food and beverage. Yesterday we tested some uh, surf and turf nachos, the uh, Wago beef hot dogs. Uh, there was shrimp, lobster, dogs. the whole oh, nine. God, that looks good. <laughs> 
That yeah. looks just <laughs> amazing. Ooh, so hot dogs. so um, the Chiefs are staying at, um, Lake at the Westin. Yep. And yep. Um, Travis and Taylor are getting a house. They're renting a house right by the Westin. Um, I would assume with 400,000 people there and a lot of Swifties, I'm sure, that people are going to try and Line go up over outside the there. I, so I would assume security is going to be pretty heavy there, too. Yeah, and you know what? We just, when we actually drove up here, we had to go through security. You know, there are police at every, you know, stop. Um, we just went through metal detectors. There's police dogs. I mean, so security is very tight here right now. Um, it'll be interesting, you know, if Kansas City wins. Like, they're known for going out after and stuff. And we'll see, you know, because I'm hearing that, like, you know, if Taylor's with, you know, obviously Travis, that they might not want to hit the nightclubs and be out in the public eye. So maybe there'll be a house party at Lake Las Vegas. We don't know. Oh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> Wow, yeah. this, I, I got to tell you, again, you painted a great picture. Yeah, uh, it, yeah. Is gonna be, it is going to be exciting. You're not planning on get, you're not planning on getting any sleep for the next week or so, are you? No, I'm not planning on getting any sleep. And I wanted everyone to know, because everyone keeps asking us about the Winfield Club inside Allegiant Stadium. Like, the tables are so expensive. They started at, like, 1.5 mil, Oh my god! by the way. <laughs> what? And uh, <laughs> there's a few left, believe it or not. So, oh yeah, apparently god. they're going oh. for about 650000 um, So I just got on, some Harv. information. Charles, there come, you on, Harv. come on, Harv. Come on, Harv. Come on. I need a sponsor. So I need a I just sponsor. talked to one of the <laughs> to the VIP hosts, and you know, he said, "Hey, call me, Jay Sean White. Call me. I, you know, they got a couple tables left. So if anyone's looking for a table, six. How many people can I put at the table? <laughs> I think can, you can, can put thousand, ten, ten to twelve. Yeah, about ten to twelve. <laughs> uh, Dana, so Harvey, get a table, and then I'll come join you. Why is, this, wait a minute, why is this on me? Come on, you're a sponsor. <laughs> Dana, thanks so much for being hey, with us. Hey, Dana, me. this is of great. Course. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Of course. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Have fun. Thanks, Dana. Wow. She really painted a good picture. It's, she it's knows gonna be Vegas an amazing week. Okay, we're taking a break. All right, when we come back, Killer Mike speaking out about that arrest at the Grammys. What went down from his perspective? We know what the security guard is claiming. Now you're gonna hear Mike's side of the story when we come back. Welcome back to TMZ Live. Uh, what an incredible 48 hours for Killer Mike. And we are now finally getting, boy, talk about the highs, lows, and the highs and the lows. Between the, the Grammy win, three Grammys, sweeps uh, at the Grammys, wins the three categories he was nominated, gets arrested, but then finds out that his son is finally getting the life-saving kidney transplant. After three years of waiting. That he desperately needed. Well, I'll tell you more about the surgery and how that turned out. But first, this is what Mike had to say once the surgery was over, he finally spoke out about the arrest uh, at the Grammys. He said, as you can imagine, there was a lot going on uh, and there was some confusion around which door my team and I should enter. We experienced an overzealous security guard, but my team and I have the utmost confidence that I will ultimately be cleared of all wrongdoing. So, so we should that say, started. We should say, just so in case you didn't know, he was at the Grammys in LA at the uh, crypto at crypto.com arena and so he goes outside after and winning and it's pouring rain by the way tries to get back in and apparently there was some confrontation at, there at the uh, door when he went in so it sounds like from we knew that the security guard what we knew is the security guard reported uh an assault was the way that uh, it was described that she was knocked to the ground she right said. knocked to the ground and that she wanted to place him under citizen's arrest that's what you see here, the security guard surrounding him before LAPD showed up to actually arrest him and booked him for simple misdemeanor battery. Yeah, so the one, I guess, missing piece of the puzzle at this point, which I don't even know if it really matters, is why was Killer Mike and his team outside? Because he won he won his Grammys, and then I guess, for whatever reason, went outside, went outside. and then tried coming back in. And look, I mean, crypto's big, right? There's a lot of entrances and whatnot. So, like, who knows? Maybe he went outside for a smoke break or something and tried coming That's what back I was in. Thinking, yeah. Who knows? Maybe something like that. In any case, he's blaming an overzealous guard. He was booked for battery. In my opinion, the whole thing is ridiculous and just needs to be swept away at this point. I, it's got to go through the process. Obviously, I think it's going to go through the city attorney's office and yada, 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 whatever. <laughs> it's silly. It's it's I nonsense. Mean, it's, it's he has bigger system. fish to fry. You guys alluded to the fact that his son was literally going, going into a kidney transplant surgery yesterday, and that actually happened. And Killer Mike, we know, was by his side. This is his son, Pony Boy, who I think is a teenager. Um, he's uh, 21 now, this photo. Is okay, there you go, 21, but, yeah. excuse me. And Killer Mike was there, and from what we're hearing, the Went surgery well. was successful. The, the transplant is done, the, and apparently and the, the kidney is now working. That's right. So 
he, this is in his rear view. He doesn't care at this point. It's, it's small potatoes. He won his Grammys and he's happy about that. And uh, I feel bad for Killer Mike. So now for all of you watching, I wanna explain to you why there's some advantage to being older than dirt, okay? Because <laughs> I am. So um, I, I think I know. I like you say it with pride now. You're like, older I do. than I'm dirt. Le I'm leaning into it now. All right, um, don't lean too far. <laughs> I'll fall, I'll break a hip. Um, no, I think I know what's gonna happen here. So this is at the LA City Attorney's Office. It's a misdemeanor. What they do, and I, I know they're gonna do this in this situation, they have something called an office hearing where they bring, they'll bring Killer Mike and the security guard into this office hearing in their offices and they'll say, look, you got too heated, you may have been overzealous, don't do this again, don't do that again and then they just end it. And it's there's essentially never... like being called to the principal's office. Kind of, and, and then, but both there's sides no, sit down. And there's no prosecution, and it goes away, and I think that's what's gonna happen here. Hey, it's Autumn Joy calling from Prince George's County, and my son, uh, Richard Lee. Uh, you know, I'm old as dirt, right, with you all, so I remember those days as well, but let's get into it. You know, whatever happened to just extending some grace, you know? Why did the security guard not just say, hey, let's get out the rain, let's stand up in this four-year area, and let's clear this up? It's a black man walking in the rain with a suit on where the Grammys is taking place. Where do they think he belonged, you know? It's Black History Month, bruh. We did not want to see those images of Killer Mike in handcuffs when he just got three Grammys. I mean, come on, LAPD. We got to do better, man. Well, it's security. Oh yeah, it's not, it's not, not an LAPD. LAPD. It's, it's security. But, yeah. but forget your point. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was good, by the way. That was good. Okay. By the way, if she's older than dirt, I'm... Uh, <laughs> yeah, you got to you gotta upgrade. Harvey, <laughs> Harvey Lava. Uh, Okay, All right. we are going to uh, we're going to switch gears. Yes, uh, some really sad news this morning that Toby Keith uh, has passed away mm. after battling stomach cancer. He had made uh, made it public um, back in 2022 that he was diagnosed. Toby Keith was fantastic. He uh, and we're, everyone was talking about it this morning. Just all the songs you ran down that you just sort of sing in your head when you hear uh, Toby Keith and. Um, Oh, he, was. he is definitely going to be missed. And not only, I mean, obviously incredible success in his own right, um, but also played a, a role in, in, in Taylor Swift becoming who she is today. You can't get away from it. I know, this. you can't get away from it. But um, He signed her in 2005. But she acknowledges it. Um, yeah. You know, and I think in 2005 did an interview when she was, her first album was about to come out and talked about how much Toby Keith meant to her in this uh, the process of, getting that album out. Yeah. She came to Nashville last year writing her own songs, singing them, and hoping someone would like them. Toby Keith did. So much so that he just signed her to his new record label. That makes them partners. You're in the room with him and you can feel it. There's a power there and you're just like, oh my God. So I don't think I'll ever get to a point where I won't see him and be like, oh my God, that's Toby Keith. You know, yeah. beyond signing Taylor Swift, obviously that's a big deal, but his impact and legacy, I think, goes way beyond that. It's crazy that he was one of the biggest country stars of the 90s, but he wasn't like the top tier A-list of like the Garth Brooks, George Strait people. He was huge, and then in the 2000s got even bigger and had a 30-year career just cranking out hits. Well, my name's Oya, I'm from Vancouver, Canada, and yeah, it's sad to see a country legend like him pass away. I was uh, raised in Georgia, so big country scene there, and it's sad to see such a legend pass away. It is, yeah. it, re it, it really is. Uh, God, it, it, bear, it bears saying, and it should be said every day, cancer sucks. Cancer, cancer just sucks. sucks. And the most important thing in life is health. Yep. Uh, okay, we are gonna take a break. All right, when we come back, there is one Super Bowl player who did not get a barrage of Taylor Swift questions. Unfortunately for Patrick Mahomes, he got questions about his father's arrest. Patrick Sr. arrested for DWI over the weekend. You can hear what his son, the Super Bowl champ, has to say about it. Some new details on the arrest of Patrick Mahomes Sr. We told you was busted for DWI in Texas over the weekend. We'll get to those in just a second, but first, his son arrived in Las Vegas at Media Day, and of course, his dad's arrest did come up. Here's what Patrick had to say about it. Yeah, um, he's doing good. Uh, I haven't, don't really want to get into it too much, but um, um, he's doing good for, for whatever the, the situation is. 
Um, it's a family matter, so I'll just keep it to the family, um, and that's all I really have to say at this point. It's almost the exact same situation he just went through a couple months ago. I, I know we talked about this yesterday, but Jackson Mahomes brother. was arrested, yeah, and, and he had this same press conference a couple weeks or a couple days after, and he had to deal with the same answer. He said, look, it's a personal matter. I don't want to talk about it, and, and I'm, I'm moving forward. Yeah, I know the, the cops, the, the affidavit in his father's arrest uh, was released, and uh, boy, from what the cops are saying, this was... Not, this was a no doubt DWI from the way they describe it. Some very disturbing allegations. Uh, in the police documents, they wrote that he had a 16 ounce can of Coors open in his center console. They also say he, he admitted to drinking before getting behind the wheel. They also said he bombed kind of field sobriety tests, failed them pretty, pretty badly. Uh, and then they threw him behind bars. And, and this, is his, this is his third DWI and- Well, this uh, would be his third Conviction for conviction if, if he's convicted, right? Yeah. And that would be a mandatory jail sentence yeah. um, that could be extensive. So, um, yeah, he is dealing with a lot. Yeah. I mean, especially after his brother and now this. But um, he's also a focused guy. Yeah, he's definitely focused on uh, on his job, and you know that's that's why they have the media day at the beginning of the week. They get all, all of that out of the way, and then the idea is the players uh, go into lockdown. They go into lockdown, and they focus on their game plan, and they you, shut out the world. You think that all goes away? I'm not talking about Patrick. I'm talking about Taylor. That doesn't go yeah. away. No, I think that it does go away. No, it builds. Nope. It builds. Nope, not for the players. It will for everybody around them. They don't want to deal with that for the rest of the week, and they're not going to. They're going to hear about it. I mean, they nope. know. They're, they're, they're not. Andy Reid says, nope. No, no one, no one, no TV, no radio. But they're not no podcasts. They're not jurors who are sequestered. <laughs> That's right. They're sequestered <laughs> no. for the rest of the week in they're Vegas. They're not sequestered. No. Yeah, it's your boy Spoon from Cincinnati, man. We're talking about Patrick Mahomes Sr. Yeah, it's kind of flagrant to me, man. Not only was his registration expired by two years, he was riding around with an open can in the center console. It's kind of silly to put yourself in this risk when you have all the resources available to avoid it. Not to mention the most important week of your son's, you know, yeah. career. So it's it's really rough that he, you know, chose that route when I really think it could have been avoided. This is one of the reasons that I get on this kick with marijuana, that how do you make marijuana illegal when you look at what happens with alcohol in this country and what it does to people and how toxic it is and how it ruins people's lives Yet it's not only legal, it's celebrated. Right. And I'm not saying ban alcohol. You're also not saying that you should smoke weed and drive. Of course not. Right. But at the same time, how are you how do you reconcile making weed illegal and celebrate alcohol and put it on television? It just makes no sense well, to me. One is a more uh, successful lobby. Put it that way. Maybe that's it. <laughs> okay, we're gonna take a break. All right, so uh, when we come back, one of uh, the hot spots here in town, Craig's. We show it to you all the time. Celebs are there constantly. Well, there's a couple who was robbed outside of Craig's, and they think that celebrities were part of the reason that security didn't do a thing to help them as the robbery happened. You're gonna see it all on camera when we come back. Oh, well, celebrity hotspot Craig's is now uh, getting sued by a couple of customers. Not celebrities, um, but uh, the couple that is suing thinks that celebrities had something to do with uh, the fact that security did not help them. Uh, this was all captured on surveillance video, uh, and they say that they were robbed out at the valet stand. Um, and there is security uh, outside of Craig's, but they said that what happened was security was busy helping people take photos, um, and they never paid any attention to them as they these, um, the suspects walked up and rolled, they took the guy's Rolex, they took a necklace uh, from him as well, and then made a clean getaway. I gotta say something about this. I don't get this lawsuit, and I'll tell you why. What restaurant is required to have security? And as a matter of fact, at Craig's, I would think there's less of a reason to have security because there are so many photographers there that can buffer it. And so I don't see a yeah. duty to even have security. I, I was there last night and as I was walking out, there was two security guards walking in. It was very clear they were security, they had badges on. I believe one of them even had a gun, like was armed. Mm -hmm. And I've seen them there before in the past, but like, is it their job? I mean, that's a public sidewalk, so why is it Craig's responsibility?
Hey, my name is Brian. I'm from Denver, Colorado. And I mean, I, I, you almost question, is it the security's job to risk their life? How far do you really go in security before you become a cop? You know, like, yeah, you're right. You, it, it's it, you. He can't do much it, it, besides get stabbed or something himself. You know, like what can he really do in that situation? Yeah, he may be armed, but now. He now steps into a situation that has nothing to do with the restaurant. Yeah, yeah. You right. see, the security guard is the guy by the pole there, trying to do something, but I don't see this it was one. already over. Okay, what else do you guys want to talk about? Hi, my name is Keisha. I'm from Burlington, New Jersey. I think Jesse is more concerned about what's going to happen to him once he goes to jail, rather than the Supreme Court overturning his conviction. So he should just do his little five month. Protective custody, especially since he's not going to do the whole five anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got to say. He's not willing to go. Yeah, yeah, and don't dismiss this too quickly. Mm. I, I'm going to be interested in this. One more. Aaron Robbins, New York, New York, Taylor Swift. I mean, thank God for Taylor Swift. Boy, she can fix anything. Her amount of white female viewers on the NFL is changing lives of men across the country. <laughs> like, they are so mad that they have to share their TVs and their NFL days now with their girls because they're waiting to see Taylor Swift. But, you know, ratings are up, and that's all that really matters. So thank you again, Taylor Swift. Ratings are really up. The NFL loves that, but NFL fans aren't necessarily some. Thrilled. Okay, some. taking a break. All right, when we come back, Leo DiCaprio, we always see him surrounding himself with beautiful women in real life. Well, we got some shots from his new movie. He is doing it again on set. You'll see where he's shooting and who he's with when we come back. So Leo DiCaprio is uh, starring in this new Paul Thomas Anderson film. They are shooting up in Northern California, and we'd seen him with Regina King, but as if that wasn't enough uh, for Leo. Now we, found, we see him shooting in Sacramento with Tiana Taylor. Hmm. Well, boy, no, I, I, how did Paul Thomas Anderson convince him to take this role? Yeah, you're gonna be uh, spending your days uh, sitting across from Regina King, and then, I, I, we don't know anything about the plot, but it looks like, is he playing a lawyer? It looks like he's playing a lawyer. And is and, and is Tiana the, the client, or is she also a lawyer? I think he's, I playing, I, I think he's playing a lawyer. Uh, a lawyer with a hair bun? It happens. <laughs> you know who has that? Tom Mesereau. One, right. one of the great lawyers right. in L.A. Uh -huh. Tom Mesereau, um has maybe, a bun. Maybe Leo is inspired by Mesereau. There you go. There you go. <laughs> um, have a good day. We will talk to you tomorrow about uh, the lead-up to Super Bowl, especially. Yes, indeed.